everyone, and welcome to Heritage Talks. This is a presentation by the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network. And my name is Heather Darch. I'm a project director, and I am your host today for this wonderful presentation. And today we are doing a live hybrid uh, uh, show. We are on Zoom and we are live in the beautiful Charzadec Synagogue in NDG in Montreal. So it's wonderful to be here. Uh, this is my first time in this neighborhood. I've had a wonderful tour with Norm and uh, it's been uh, lovely so far. So thank you for welcoming us, welcoming us into your space. Our series theme this year is called Sharing Our Heritage, Inspiring Stories from Across Quebec's Heritage Community. And we've invited people from heritage and cultural and community groups to tell us their inspiring stories. And it's exciting to hear all of the work that has been going on in the museums, in archives, in cultural and community groups, whose vision has had a lasting impact on the history and heritage of Quebec. Quan itself is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to preserve and protect the history of Quebec in general, but of English speaking people specifically. And of course, you're welcome to become a member if you'd like. Uh, you can go to our website and find out all the activities that we do. And membership gives you access to workshops like this and to our quarterly publication called Quebec Heritage News. And we have some copies at the back by the delicious buffet that is out there. Um, and you can take advantage of a 30% discount. That's just $20 for a one-year membership if you'd like. And you can go to our website at qahn.org to find out more about us. You're welcome to join. I would like to thank the funders who make this series possible, including Canadian Heritage, the Zeller Family Foundation, and the Townshippers Foundation. And as you can tell by all the cameras and wires and speakers, the presentation is being recorded. It's going out live on our Facebook page. And uh, if you would like to see the presentation again or see uh, any of our other presentations in our Heritage Talk series, you can go to our website or to our Facebook page or to our YouTube channel uh, to see the presentations again. If you're joining us on Zoom today, we'd ask you to please keep your camera turned off. And at the very end, you can type your questions into the comments or, or the chat box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll transmit those questions and comments to our speaker. If you're watching us on Facebook, you can type your comments under the video, tell us where you're watching from and what your connection is to Montreal. Our guest speaker today is Norm Spatz. Norm was born in New Jersey and settled in Montreal after receiving his master's in architecture at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Arriving in Montreal shortly before the demolition of the Van Horn House, he became intrigued with Montreal history. That event convinced him to become a member of Save Montreal, where he founded a series of walking tours. For eight years, he had his own office and won an award for historical restoration from Crédit Foncier. Shortly after the award, he began teaching architectural technology in a French sejet. Eventually, he began teaching English as a second language and then was named the English language editor of the Ministry of Education's Prof Web website for promoting information technology in Quebec's colleges. He wound up writing two nonfiction articles a week about how IT was being used in the province's colleges for six years. Now retired, Norm has become focused on writing novels and researching the history of his neighborhood. We welcome Norm Spatz today, and his presentation is called The Big Bang, an Instant Neighborhood, Western NDG, the 50s and the Jews. Welcome, Norm. Thank you, Heather, for a wonderful presentation. And by doing that presentation, you have eliminated my first two slides. So <laughs> let's go right through this. Um, simply to put on the screen uh, the information that Heather uh, mentioned. Uh, this is a, a belonging and identity grant 
Uh, and in essence, what the grant funded was reworking the archives of the synagogue. And it is from the work of archiving the records of the synagogue that we learned a lot uh, about its history. And just to um, give credit to the funding behind the scenes, you know, one agency receives funding from another agency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the uh, Khan has received help from the Secretariat aux Relations avec les Québécois d'expression anglaise. Uh, moving on. Now, what presentation would be complete in Quebec these days without a land acknowledgement? Um, and uh, if you read it, I will let you read it. I'm not going to say it again. Uh, unfortunately, these statements have become very formulaic. I mean, I don't want to sound uh, cynical, but when you read these statements, there is a supposition that the people that are making the statements don't own the land. And I think there's a reality here that um, we acknowledge that the land was originally uh, in the hands of the First Nations, but the reality is we're not giving it back. And uh, I think we'll see where that goes. Uh, I uh, also uh, developed this attitude uh, through a book by con member Joseph Graham, which explores the situation. And, uh, sorry. Uh, the 16th century European wars of religion set the stage for mass migration to the New World. And, of course, there was nothing new about the New World to the First Nations. It was their old world. Uh, However, um, Joe Graham's book, Insatiable Hunger, uh, illustrates uh, the, uh, the, the vast gap between the worldview of the two nations. Uh, in essence, we as inheritors of Western civilization uh, have a uh, materialistic, uh, financially oriented, uh, sort of worldview, which is compared with the worldview of the First Nations, which was based on status acquired through gift giving. And when those two different systems met, uh, I think it was a pretty certain um, uh, fact of who was going to come out the winner. And we did. Uh, and I think that if we're looking at it as members of the Jewish community, we can say, well, hey, we weren't here. We've only been here like 100 years. But the fact is we are an integral part of the major Western civilization and society that has established in this territory. And as such, let's go right back to the beginning. We acknowledge the original ownership of the land, but we're still not giving it back. Uh, okay, so the structure of this presentation is an increasingly tight focus. We're beginning at the beginning, folks. We're beginning at the Ice Age. And uh, it's, uh, th we're focusing through time on events of relevance to the founding of this synagogue, Congregation Shari Zedek. Uh, and it ends with the controversy in the synagogue over mixed seating, uh, which I discovered information on while we were working on the archives. Uh, we begin, like I said, right at the beginning, because it fascinated me, uh, with the geography and geology that made the founding of our neighborhood possible. Uh, we then examine how those geographical factors enabled the settlement of NDG. Then we, having established that, we step back a little and we look at the Jewish community. What's the history of the Jewish community within Montreal? How did it settle? And how, at a time when this area was developing, was the Jewish community ripe to expand into it? Um, knowing the history of what has come before uh, we entered on the scene can perhaps allow us to understand the wealth of facts and factors that have created the world, the province, the neighborhood, and right down to now this synagogue, 
where we find ourselves, which really has a passionate history. And um, I sort of forgot to say it at the beginning because I was so excited over Heather's presentation. But as we go through this presentation, I intend to explain to you why the title, The Big Bang, A New Neighborhood, is dramatically uh, the correct title for this presentation. Okay, so we're going back. Uh, to many people, who visit uh, Lake Champlain today, few would guess that, uh, let's see if we can, there we go. Few would guess that Lake Champlain was really an arm of, uh, the, uh, of, of a larger body of water. Uh, between 10 to 13,000 years ago, the Champlain Sea occupied an area that extended west of Ottawa and east of Quebec City. The sea was created by the meltwaters of glaciers as the last ice age was coming to a close. The water from those glaciers flowed out of a small sea through a vast gash in the land south of the current site of Quebec City and into the ocean. As the massive weight of ice from the Ice Age crept over the land for thousands of years lessened, the sea, the land which had been crushed, began to rise. And it ceased eventually to be part of the ocean and more a feature of the land. Fresh water replaced brine. And then one day in a location where we happen to be standing, a remnant of a fault in the mantle of the earth, which had allowed magma to seep into the crust of the earth, was exposed. Uh, it had been originally a much taller mountain. It was not a volcano. Uh, the ice, uh, the glaciers swept over it, ground it down, pounded it. Then it was in the lake, silt deposited around it. But eventually, it emerged from the earth. Uh, the island was born in fire, uh, well, I've got, sorry, approximately 125 million years ago, uh, the island of Montreal emerged from the sea. And what happened was, when you're underwater, it was a very silty sea. The Champlain Sea was, was not pristine. It had a lot of uh, schmutz draining into it from the glaciers. And um, they be, the, the, the silt that was in the water began building up around the rock. And so what you got was you got layers or terraces uh, of, of land that deposited. Now, some of you may recognize this. This is, uh, this is the sort of linear park that is developed to the south of NDG known as uh, La Falaise and which means the cliff. And if you look, uh, another interesting thing to see here is that, I'm never quite sure. Okay, here we go. This is the area. Oh yes, good. I think I better look at the screen for this. Note the slope of the cliff here. You don't realize just how steep that area is until, well, until you're on it. But uh, so let's, Let's get this, let me get this pointer out. Uh, as the slowly, uh, okay, the glaciers had rounded, we've gotten through that. Um, and then the waters of the Lake Iroquois, which would become Lake Ontario, broke through into the St. Lawrence Valley. So flowing to the shores of the Champlain Sea, once the main drainage of the Great Lakes was no longer towards the Gulf of Mexico, the initial small trickle of the St. Lawrence River became a mighty torrent carrying fresh water from all of the recently created Great Lakes. The cliff on the island continued to ascend. It then separated two giant plains of fertile forested land at the shores of the now vast St. Lawrence River. And years later, the people who lived both above and below this cliff would name it after Saint Jacques. And under that river lay another steep drop of land created by another remnant of those ancient flows of magma from the heart of the earth. The drop under the water was no longer beneath a calm, shallow sea. 
too short to create a waterfall, as in Niagara, the waters of the St. Lawrence River roiled and foamed, only coming to rest in front of a calm harbor on the small island that had formed around the remnant of the mighty deposits of magma. And then came, finally, the First Nations. A tribe of the Iroquois nation settled on the flat plains. No one alive today knows when the island first became a home to a community of humans. Hundreds of years passed before the native culture that had developed near the rapids of the St. Lawrence River came into contact with that of the culture of the Kingdom of France. But we may not know when that culture started, but we do know when France came on the scene. Uh, Jacques Cartier became the first European to reach the area now known as Montreal in 1535 when he entered the village of Hachalaga on the island of Montreal while in search of a passage to Asia during the age of exploration. As the voyage came to a close, Jacques Cartier would write in his article, Today I have completed my second voyage, which I can say had taught me a lot about how different things are in this world and how people start building up communities according to their common beliefs, obviously in translation, but those are his real words, which is pretty amazingly visionary for explorers of the time. Uh, Jacques Cartier's first voyage a year earlier had not advanced as far down the St. Lawrence River and focused mainly on land in what is now the Atlantic provinces of Canada. But that first contact between Jacques Cartier and the Iroquois ended on a, a peaceful and dignified note. Unfortunately, that auspicious beginning was followed by a sad tale of uh, abuse and degradation of the First Nations at the hands of the Europeans. And the celebration of the first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation on September 30th, 2021, is part of Canada's attempt to redress these wrongs. In 1642, the future city of Montreal was founded by Paul de Chamedy, Sœur de Maisonneuve. The peaceful native village that Jacques Cartier had found in 1535 was gone, and in its place were the peaceful Algonquin, as well as the warlike Haudenosaunee, who were a tribe of the Iroquois. The French considered the island of Montreal to be part of a colony of France. The First Nations living on that island were not that sure. Uh, they weren't totally in agreement with the idea. They probably didn't even understand the idea of property ownership at the time. And the Europeans would learn how to survive in an environment that was far more difficult and dangerous than it had originally appeared to Jacques Cartier. So let's look at an imaginary conversation. Uh, and I always say that it's an imaginary conversation because I wasn't there. But uh, I've tried to string together the facts and sort of bring them to life. Uh, the date was March 30th, 1644, one day after a disastrous ambush of 30 French settlers by the Haudenosaunee tribe. The members of the young colony of Quebec were learning that their relationship with the native tribes, whose land France had claimed, uh, were not as one-sided in the face of superior European technology as the colony's leaders had assumed. Imagine, imagine, a conversation between Paul de Chamedy, uh, Sir de Maisonneuve, the young commander of the forces defending Ville-Marie, and one of the colony's more ambitious settlers, Jean de Carry. If only we had had more wisdom and restraint, Jean, Paul de Chamedy might have complained, we were fools. We didn't realize just how aggressive the Haudenosaunee could be after all of those years of peaceful relations with the Algonquin. Jean de Carry looked at how the leader of the small colony took the disastrous defeat at the hands of the natives to heart. Look, Paul, said Jean, we made a mistake, and now we have to live with it. And slowly, getting out of imaginary conversations, in the real world, the colony prospered. 
tentatively de Maisonneuve awarded land grants beyond the walls of Ville Marie, but never far, so that a citizen could take refuge within the walls in case of attack. Montrealers cautiously continued moving beyond the city's walls. At first, they stayed close to the city. In January 1648, Pierre Gadois, a laborer, got Montreal's first land grant on the banks of what I call the St. Pierre River. I think now the city of Montreal calls it the Petite Riviere, and believe it or not, although this first grant was really near Place Uville uh, in old Montreal, that river ran a couple of blocks from the synagogue. Uh, it really runs quite close, and it it's completely now, it's running in sewers, and uh, it started at the mountain. Um, so no one was looking to be a hero settling far from the walls when the danger of attack was a recent memory. But by 1650, the memory and the raw terror of the Haudenosaunee attack had lessened. So let us once again put ourselves in the place of one of the settlement's early residents. The most adventurous and courageous citizens of Ville-Marie, such as Jean de Carry, had adapted to their new home. De Carry knew the land. More than others, he explored the wilds around the small settlement. He must have realized that the only way that the community could grow was for its residents to discover the territory that lay just outside their stockade. The problem with the natives was not going to go away. Six years after that first Indian attack, we can imagine our two early settlers, de Maisonneuve and de Carry, once again in conversation. De, Gary, de Carry once again repeats the obvious. We can't beat them in the forest. Uh, that's where they have the advantage. We need an early warning system so that everyone can take refuge behind the walls of the village in case of attack. Well, what are you proposing? De Maisonneuve might have impatiently asked. And as anybody who chairs committees knows, he was probably tired of people telling him what they wanted done without explaining how he could do it. Uh, have you noticed that high plateau that rises above the village on the south flank of our mountain? De Carey could have replied. Ever been up there? He could have added. A couple of times, but Jean, I'm really too busy to spend much time on such pastimes, would have been a likely response. I'm not talking about a pastime, sir. If you go to the cliff that separates that plateau from the land nearer the city, you have a panoramic view of all of the territory around our settlement. Yes, said de Maisonneuve, who would have begun to get an idea of where Jean de Carry's discussion was leading. De Maisonneuve continues, a shot fired from there could warn everyone that an Indian attack was imminent but are we to station guards at such a distance from Ville-Marie? No, sir, de Carey could have countered. We don't need a guard for the most part. We need a farmer. The land is fertile, and the cliff to the south makes it reasonably easy to defend. Are you proposing yourself as this watchman farmer? De Maisonneuve might have queried with a wry smile. Finally, he got the message, Jean might have thought as possibly a similar smile crept across his own face before he assumed a more serious expression. I've been talking my idea over with a couple of friends like Jean Le Duc. If you gave us each a grant of land, we figured the two of us could defend ourselves as long as we didn't do anything stupid like that crew of fools who were ambushed by the Haudenosaunee a few years back. And now this is where our story really does stop being an imaginary conversation. This stuff happened, the conversation didn't. But uh, the historic De Carry had really been talking about settling on top of this cliff that had formed as the island of Montreal rose. And this is where we currently find the MUHC hospital and anyone who has been there knows the view is amazing. Uh, in our imaginary exchange, de Maisonneuve could have replied slowly, expressing his respect for Jean de Carry. Now, this is the kind of thinking that's going to make this colony a success. 30 arpents, each to you and Le Duc, should allow you to take care of your needs while you take care of Ville-Marie. 
If you're serious, I'm ready to give you the land tomorrow. You and Leduc will be ready to plant for spring in just a few months. And so however that conversation transpired, eight years after the founding of the young settlement of the colony of Ville Marie, on November 18, 1650, the first Europeans really did settle the plains above the cliff that had risen from the Champlain Sea. Jean de Carry and Jean Le Duc each received 30 arpents of land from the colony commander de Maisonneuve and built a primitive cabin on what is currently uh, the site of the McGill University Health Center. Um, now, just to say, this is not a photo of that first cabin, but it's not far off. Uh, it was probably built by uh, De Carey's son in 1680. And you're saying, well, how did you get a camera that far back? And uh, what is amazing is that the house itself survived, handed from generation to generation of De Carey's, always going to the oldest son, until the early 20th century, where it was demolished uh, to build the roundhouse of, I believe, what is now Canadian National Railroad. So it's a sad story, but at least we have the photo. Um, and they say in the caption of the photo, it's 1650, but I'm pretty sure it's 1680. In any case, needless to say, when you're doing something like this, you simplify the idea, the idea that the settlement was, uh, was this brilliant idea by De Carey. It took a bit of guts. Uh, they settled up there. The De Careys lost a son who was killed. Uh, Jean Le Duc uh, had to take time off to build his house because conditions were just too dangerous. But they got it built. They, they went up there. The idea was a little difficult to achieve, but in the end, they got this stuff built, and that is the beginning of NDG. That's how we got settled up there. Okay, so now we've got people on, DG, on NDG. So now let's take a look at how it was organized. Anyone who does research into the history of Montreal or for that matter, anywhere else in the province of Quebec, learns that in French, the term côte means hill. Okay, just, I know you're sort of semi-francophone. We've got our two francophones. Jean-Pierre, when you think of côte in your mind, or Norman, either one, what do you think of? How would you translate côte into English? Hill. Hill. Pardon? Good. Okay. So... You know, they're saying hill. Yeah, well, did the founders of the city of Cote St. Luke, when they made that name, anybody ever thought of that, say St. Luke Hill? Anybody have an idea of where St. Luke Hill is? Because uh, it ain't there. Uh, and uh, and I, I wondered about that for years. I used to think it was the Falaise, uh, that that was the cliff. Where was the coat? And then I've learned that in an article in the Cahier de Géographie du Québec, which was written, <coughs> excuse me, in 1984, there was an answer to this question. And it really is based in the very special way that the island of Montreal was settled. Uh, oh, I always keep on advancing this. Uh, Luger Beauregard, the author, writes the following abstract of his article. Quote, are the structural elements of the first settlement patterns on Montreal Island. Nowhere else in the province of Quebec have they reached such importance as a system of settlement. They appeared as such about 1665 along the banks of the St. Lawrence River and in the inner part of the island at the turn of the 18th century. Their development can be traced through diverse documents until 1834 when Monsieur Jobin, who was a surveyor, produced a map showing the system of coats, <coughs> sorry, in their heyday. And, you know, most of Quebec, and again, I sort of take what I know for granted, we sort of have heard on and off the term seigneurie. 
Uh, and a seigneurie was the development pattern for the province of Quebec. You would settle along a river. People would divide farms into long, narrow strips. There would be a very narrow uh, frontage along the river or later on a road. And the fields were long and narrow would go back. But that system didn't make sense on the island of Montreal. You're not looking to create essentially a, a highway uh, leading to Quebec City or you know another major destination. You're looking to figure out a settlement pattern. And um, from long and narrow lots with short frontage on the banks of the river didn't necessarily need to happen on the banks of a river. Let's, let's blow this up and take a look. So I'm always scared that I can't, I can't get to the, um, if we look here, so can I move this? Yes, ooh, yes. So we're looking at these various coats and you can see them illustrated. Like uh, this is a uh, coat de, well, Côte de Vertu, Côte Vertu. Uh, so that was a settlement. You've got about 40 people who've got their farms along a little road, and that's where you lived. You lived in Côte Vertu. Or, which certainly applies here, uh, I don't know if we have Côte St. Luke, but that was the idea. Here we have Côte, uh, Côte Notre Dame de Lies. So here we have Cote Notre Dame de Lies. Sound familiar? And, you know, again, these were all little settlements. And um, I'm, I'm sort of going through my notes. And I think I'm just going to flip over here because this is the part that I find really interesting. In 1663, this map is from 1879, but in 1663, the ownership of the island passed to the Sulpicians. And in, essentially, that was pure genius on the part of the French administration because in 1760, when Quebec was conquered by the English, um, really the land, the, the island of Montreal belonged to the Sulpicians. And even though it was theoretically administered by the English, uh, it was the Sulpicians who were the landowners and who were running things. Uh, Let's, let's take a look, let's go back though, after this change of ownership in 1663 and see how the system worked in little old Cote St. Luke. Um, by 1702, there were 25 coats on the island of Montreal. 16 of them were along the river and nine were inland. By 1750, the Cote St. Luke had been settled, branching out from Cote St. Pierre near the MUHC hospital uh, the original settlement, as well as Côte Saint Antoine, the Côte, which became Westmount. Uh, at some point, the settlers of the Côte Saint Luc would have called on the Sulpicians to create a chemin du roi. The superior of the seminary or his delegate would come to the settlement and determine the route of the road with the agreement of the residents. Markers with the Sulpician stamp would be placed along the route, uh, and it was the responsibility of the settlers to clear the land where the road crossed their territory. Now, here on this map from 1879, because we can't stay in the 1600s forever, uh, we can see how the descendants of the people who lived in these coats and the Dakaris and other early settlers came to be landowners throughout the neighborhood as younger children established new farms. By 1879, some of these landowners may have lived in town, but others most assuredly lived in farmhouses on their land. Legal ownership of the land was amazingly, even into the late 1800s, still in the hands of the Sulpicians. Uh, if you had a farm and you were selling it to somebody like an English developer, uh, and it was the late 1800s, you had to go to the Sulpicians and legally buy your land from the Sulpicians, and then you could sell it to somebody else. Um, why had this expansion happening happened? 
1665, an army regiment arrived from France, and as time passed, these families and their families on top of the Falaise were fruitful, and since we're in a synagogue, and multiplied, uh, and they were owned by one of the de Carey descendants, or the Le Duc, or the Urtebis, People living in Ville Marie were also reassured by the arrival of the troops and began petitioning the government of the city for land grants that were a little further from the safety of the city's protective walls. And at this point, to this very day, the term coat really caught on among Montrealers, whether they considered the meaning hill or edge or even side by side, coat a coat. A coat came to mean a small settlement outside of the walls of a city, particularly in Montreal, but in other Quebec cities as well. And if you look at some of the names on the, this land, uh, you can see a lot of de Carries, uh, Sarrazin, and what's fun is, now this is, here, let me get the laser pointer here. I've learned how to do this. Is it on here? Yes. So if we look, this is, Oh, good, I've got it. So this is Cote St. Luke Road. Um, and if we look at Cote St. Luke Road, we look as we go further west, uh, the names are a lot more French. They're still farms. They're big. And you can see the little squares, which are, are buildings that are built. Uh, and as we go around the mountain and south of the mountain, we're seeing a lot more English names. We're seeing smaller lots. Uh, because these are fonctionnaires, bureaucrats, who are coming to move further west into the cleaner air and the beautiful atmosphere of Westmount. And uh, so we can see that there's a wave forming of settlement. People are moving west uh, and living more, shall we say, urbanized lifestyles, and the farmers who are sitting here in the east, uh, yes, oh good, I'm so glad this thing is working, who are living here in the west, excuse me, they can see it coming. They know it's coming. You know, even beginning as early as the 1860s, they knew that people were gonna like come out of the downtown area of Montreal and settle this area. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, Let's look at what was happening 30 years later in 1908. This is an overview from a gazetteer, gazetteer, whatever, uh, of the uh, center of the island of Montreal. Now let's get our rectangle up here. Uh, the rectangle encloses the city of Notre Dame de Grasse in pink. Um, the northern limit of the city of Notre Dame de Grasse is Cote St. Luke Road. But notice the fingers of Cote St. Luke that drop below Cote St. Luke Road. This is 1908. Uh, and other like towns are separating uh, from the, the, the parish, the general area, which was Coteau St. Pierre, uh, and eventually became the Paroisse de Montréal. But let's take a look at what's happening here. Uh, Westmount left in 1876, and that was a no-brainer uh, because the farmers in Cote St. Luke controlled the town, and they were not interested in floating improvement bonds for sewers and water and everything, and the people who were living in what was to become Westmount were definitely interested in promoting uh, an environment that could develop as a bedroom suburb for the English wealthy. Uh, and they needed to control their own affairs to pave streets and put in services such as sewage. The farmers who ran NDG were really not interested in paying for these improvements at the other end of their territory. Nor were they interested in paying for services to the working class settlement in St. Pierre de Lien. So St. Pierre wanted services. They split off 1893. Same story for Montreal West, which essentially was doing the Westmount phenomenon because of its commuter train station. And then, sort of in a reversal of situations, 
I think the farmers of Cote St. Luke realized that um, realized where the rest of the territory was going, and they and NDG was what is now NDG was far more urbanized, but still amazingly undeveloped. Uh, and it was looking to split off. There were several well-to-do farming families who were looking to take the town into an independent status, put in the lots that could develop it, make sure the streets were there. And the farmers of Cote St. Luke split off from NDG, formed their own little town called Cote St. Luke, and, uh, and NDG was essentially left alone. Uh, what I would say is let's look at the farmers when this division was happening. If your land, if you really wanted to be a farmer, the last thing in the world you wanted was to be part of NDG. So there were farmers who had land that was south of Cote St. Luke Road who sort of said, uh-uh, we're not, we're not going to be part of NDG. And I used to suspect that these fields eventually became some of the larger parks of our neighborhood. But that was wrong. <laughs> it didn't happen that way. But it's an interesting theory. Uh, and the remaining area became Notre Dame de Grasse West, and then eventually the independent village of Notre Dame de Grasse. And once the charter of the city of Notre Dame de Grasse was organized in 1906, one of the most fascinating yet brief periods in the history of the neighborhood began. Knowing that the municipality would be unable to survive independently. The local leaders, mainly well-to-do farmers, headed by a developer, borrowed heavily to pay for the streets and sewers that would make NDG the gracious neighborhood that it is today. They then promoted what was in effect a bidding war between the city of Montreal and the city of Westmount. Montreal was anxious to acquire NDG because it would then have completely encircled Westmount. Montreal felt that it was only a matter of time until they were then able to acquire Westmount itself. Well, maybe that wasn't a good idea. Uh, history has shown that the price that Montreal paid for NDG was steep. They had to take on for the entire city the bonds, the improvement bonds to place the sewers and the streets, that had to be assumed as a debt by the entire city of Montreal. And it certainly helped to contribute to Montreal's bankruptcy in the 1930s. So let's take a look at that. In the 20th century, therefore, uh, Notre Dame de Grasse had lost all its power to control its own destiny, perhaps with the exception of the NDG Community Council, because I know that somebody from the NDG Community Council is here. Uh, being a neighborhood of the city of Montreal, all decisions for zoning, capital improvements, and any other issues of interest to the community were to be filtered through the council of the entire city of Montreal. So let us now return to another section of the 1879 Hopkins map. So first, let's situate, and I find this uh, little pointer a little hard to do, but here, let's go, let's go on here. Where are you, pointer? Do we have a pointer? Not really. Okay, hold on a sec. Laser pointer. Okay, so how is this doing? Do we say, is there, anybody see it? Oh, okay, well, oh. Oh, right, there we are, okay. This is Code St. Luke, I should have just gone over here and pointed, but this is Code St. Luke Road. Uh, and so you can see, uh, you can get an idea that this is really, this map contains the territory where the synagogue is now. Um, just across the border in Montreal West was the fabulous, and really fabulously interesting uh, Blue Bonnets race course. And I'm sure you're saying, wait a minute, Blue Bonnets is up by uh, Toys R Us. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. It was in Montreal West uh, originally. And the name Blue Bonnets 
comes from soldiers of a Scottish force sent to defend the area of Montreal West. During the War of 1812, an American army with the invasion of Montreal as its objective was repulsed at the Battle of Chateauguay. In 1813, in preparation, however, for a possible invasion, the high ground near Avon Road was fortified, a lookout post was built on what is now Easton Avenue, and trenches were dug between Campbell and Fenwick Avenues in Montreal West, and you can still see the remains of these fortifications from time to time. And further north in Montreal West, as we can see, uh, I hate the fact that I, okay, do we have a marker on here? I'm on blue bonnets, oh good. Okay, so there, blue bonnets, you can see the blue bonnets raceway, uh, eventually it moved. Uh, but what's really interesting, okay, now I've got to get the marker back. Uh, what's really interesting is that, uh, let's take a look again at those fingers. Um, so we've got, uh, note how many of these properties were owned by de Carries. Uh, every property outlined in red was part of the city of Cote St. Luke from 1903 to 1911. Although development had not reached this area, it was felt to be inevitable. So you can see that the, uh, at, the ex at the left of it, that's Cote St. Luke Road, and all the properties below are part of the city of Montreal. So first we're gonna look and see what this really represented, and let's see if I can blow this up. So here we go. So let's take a look at the example of Grand Avenue. Uh, so Grand Avenue, oh, it goes down. So this is Grand Avenue, I'm gonna blow it up again. And as you see, Grand Avenue starts in Cote St. Luke. If you go off of Cote St. Luke Road, if you turn right, right near where Baskin Robbins ice cream is, uh, that was in Cote St. Luke. And you go down Grand Avenue, and you go all the way down, uh, so this is Grand Avenue, till an imaginary street which never got built, uh, which is just north of, I would say, Terrebonne or something like that. And whoops, you've crossed now into Montreal. So the building conditions are different, the, uh, the laws that you're building under are different, and the lot development is different. And if we look at the situation that's now happening at Monkland, when you've got people developing, we've got another big whoops, the streets don't line up. Uh, so this was a problem, and uh, if you look at the, what I, I always love that, Parc Le Duc, I don't know why. I mean, this is, just, this is just a supposition, but somehow I have a feeling that this on again, off again, Cote St. Luc, Montreal, Cote St. Luc, Montreal, was the reason why that park came into being. And it's a lovely park, but there was just simply a, a disconnect between the city limits and where development was happening. And it was, for the city of Montreal, unfortunately, a, uh, a very uh, difficult situation. And what was the concern of the people? The concern of the legislatures was, were the farmers gonna complain? If the farmers found themselves in the city of Montreal, were they gonna find that their taxes had tripled? So what they did, if you read this, uh, let's see if I can blow up some of it, is uh, that part of the village of Cote St. Luke bearing numbers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which was all the land to the south of Cote St. Luke Road, shall, shall now become part of the city of Montreal. And that was just thrown through the Quebec legislature. Furthermore, lands under cultivation in that territory will get a very low tax rate, guaranteed up until 1920. And for giving up this huge amount of territory, the city of Montreal shall pay the corporation of the village of Cote St. Luke the astounding sum of 
250 bucks. Boy, you talk about adding insult to injury. They paid them 250 bucks. But then again, what were they getting? There just wasn't, uh, there, you know, let's take a look at, forget 1912 or 1913 when this was happening. Let's take a look at uh, what this looked like in 1948. So I will, I will try and situate using this terrible pointer. Uh, so is this, are we having a pointer? No. This is Coast St. Louis Road. Okay. 1948. It's a farm. It's, it's, it's just completely farm. So maybe for the $250, it wasn't such a terrible thing. But, you know, it's farmland. Uh, my get, best guess for the one street uh, of suburban bungalows that you can see at the top right is that it's Borden Avenue. But who knows uh, at that point? I, I, I could track that up more closely. But what happened? What, again, the pressures of urbanization were just becoming increasingly irresistible for the people that had land in NDG. This is a notice of impending condemnation through eminent domain of a number of large lots in Cote St. Luke for the Canadian Pacific Railway Yard. You know, it's very hard to farm around a railway yard that's getting built. The pressure of urbanization, even in Eastern NDG is becoming irresistible. People are, are developing and building, it's, it's booming. And so, here we have 10 years later, 10 years later, the agricultural character of the neighborhood has been completely erased. And it was from this phenomenon that I got the title of my presentation, The Big Bang an instant neighborhood. And not only that, but what was happening in this neighborhood by an amazing coincidence of the development of the neighborhood and the development of the Jewish community, it was filling with Jews. Uh, it just a uh, sort of odd confluence of affairs. So we're gonna take a, a bit of a detour uh, and look at the pattern of Jewish settlement. Uh, prior to the British conquest of New France, Jews lived in Nova Scotia, but there were no official Jews in Quebec because we didn't have laïcité yet. Everything was Catholic. Uh, King Louis XIV made Canada officially a province of the Kingdom of France, and in 1663, he decreed that only Roman Catholics could enter the colony. One exception was Esther Brando, a Jewish girl who arrived in 1738 disguised as a boy and remained a year before she was returned for refusing to con convert to Catholicism. The illustration is a record of the interrogation of Esther Brando, a young Jewish woman who embarked at La Rochelle as a passenger in a boy's clothes under the name of Jacques Lafargue. On the ship, the Saint Michel, captained by Sir Salaberry, and the secretary was signed Varin, September 15, 1738. The earliest subsequent documentation of Jews in Canada are British Army records from the French and Indian War, the North American part of the Seven, seven Years' War. General Geoffrey Amherst, the first Baron of Amherst, attacked and seized Montreal, winning Canada for the British. Several Jews were members of his regiments, and among his officer corps were five Jews. Uh, Samuel Jacobs, Emmanuel de Cordova, Aaron Hart, Hananiel Garcia, and Isaac Miramer. The most prominent of these five were the business associates Samuel Jacobs and Aaron Hart. In 1759, in his capacity as commissariat to the British Army on the staff of General Sir Frederick Haldimand, Jacobs was recorded as the first Jewish resident of Quebec and thus the first Canadian Jew from 1749. 
Jacobs had been supplying British Army officers at Halifax, Nova Scotia. In 1758, he was at Fort Cumberland, and the following year, he was with Wolfe's Army at Quebec. Remaining in Canada, he became the dominant merchant of the Richelieu Valley and seigneur of St. Denis sur Richelieu. Because he married a French Canadian girl and brought his children up as Catholics, Jacob is often overlooked as the first permanent Jewish settler in Canada in favor of Aaron Hart, who married a Jew and brought up his children, or at least his sons, in the Jewish tradition. Lieutenant Hart first arrived in Canada from New York City as commissariat to Jeffrey Amherst's forces at Montreal in 1760. After his service in the army had ended, he settled at Trois-Rivières. Eventually, he became a very wealthy landowner and a respected community member. He had four sons, Moses, Benjamin, Ezekiel, and Alexander, all of whom would become prominent in Montreal and help build the Jewish community. One of his sons, Ezekiel, was elected to the legislature of Lower Canada in the by-election of April 11th, 1807 becoming the first Jew in an official opposition in the British Empire. However, Ezekiel was expelled from the legislature with his religion a major factor. Sir James Henry Craig, Governor General of Lower Canada, tried to protect Hart, but the legislature dismissed him in both 1808 and 1809. French Canadians later saw this as an attempt of the British to undermine their role in Canada. Ezekiel was re-elected to the legislature, but Jews were barred from holding elected office in Canada until a generation later, which was still pretty good. Uh, most of the early Jewish Canadians were either fur traders or served in the British Army troops. A few were merchants or landowners, although Montreal's Jewish community was small, numbering only around 200. They built the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue of Montreal, Shiereth Yis Israel. Yisrael, the oldest synagogue in Canada in 1768. It remained the only synagogue in Montreal until 1846. Some sources date the actual establishment of synagogue to 1777 on Notre Dame Street. Revolts and protests soon began calling for responsible government in Canada. The law requiring the oath on my faith as a Christian was amended in 1829 to provide for Jews to refuse the oath. In 1831, prominent French-Canadian politician Louis-Joseph Papineau sponsored a law which granted full equivalent political rights to Jews 27 years before anywhere else in the British Empire. In 1832, uh, partially because of the work of Ezekiel Hart, a law was passed that guaranteed Jews the same political rights and freedoms as Christians. In the early 1830s, German Jew Samuel Liebschitz founded Jewsburg, now incorporated as German mills into Kitchener, Ontario, a village in Upper Canada. By 1850, with all of this development and all of this excitement, the whopping population of Jews living in Canada. Anybody want to take a guess? 50? No, pessimist. How many? 77. 77, still pessimist. You're close. You're very hot. 450. 450 Jews. They've done all of this. We've gotten the laws enacted, everything. 450 Jews in the whole country. So... Yeah, moving right along, we're looking, but things were going to change, big time, bigly. Uh, with the beginning of the pogroms in Russia in the 1880s and continuing through the growing anti-Semitism of the early 20th century, millions of Jews began to flee the Pale of Settlement and other areas of Eastern Europe for the West. Although the United States received the overwhelming majority of these immigrants, Canada was also a destination of choice. And what's sort of amazing, what makes sense, as you can say, because there's a lot of promotion from the government of Canada to attract immigrants. But the other big source of attraction to Canada for these Jewish immigrants was the Canadian Pacific Railway. It was creating an image of Canada that made it a place you wanted to go. 
between 1880 and 1930, the Jewish population of Canada grew to over 155,000 people, and that's a hell of a change from 450. At the time, according to the 1901 census of Montreal, however, only 6,861 Jews were residents. But what we see is this incredible influx of Jews into the city beginning in 1880. Like all of a sudden, Jews went from nothing to a significant population in the city. And we all, well, the people of the synagogue know for sure that what the Jewish community, frankly, I think does best is we take care of our own. And um, Jewish immigrants brought a tradition of establishing a communal body called a kahila, and we see the, the word kahila in our prayer books for the people that are attending the service to look after the social and welfare needs of their less fortunate. Virtually all of these Jewish refugees were very poor. Wealthy Jewish philanthropists who had come to Canada much early, earlier, I guess they were in that 450, uh, felt that it was their social responsibility to help their fellow Jews get established in this new country. One such man was Abraham de Sola, who founded the Hebrew Philanthropic Society in Montreal and Toronto. A wide range of communal organizations and groups developed. And recently arrived immigrant Jews also founded the Landsmannschaften, these organizations of people from the same village in Europe would band together for mutual aid and support. Um, by 1911, there were Jewish communities in all of Canada's major cities. There is this, like, yeah, I sort of imagine it as like the flow of a, a faucet. I mean, there were just people flooding in year after year after year. By 1914, there were about 100,000 Jews in Canada, with three quarters living in either Montreal or Toronto. The overwhelming majority of Canadian Jews were Ashkenazim, which for the Khan people are Jews who came from Northern Europe, mainly, um, coming from the Austrian or the Russian empires. There were two competing, and cultural-wise, there were two competing strands of Jewish nationalism uh, in Eastern Europe in the early 20th century. First, there was Zionism, to found a country that is now Israel, and another tendency that favored forming separate Jewish cultural institutions with a focus on promoting Yiddish institutions such as the Montreal Jewish Library with its collection of Yiddish books uh, as an example of this later uh, tendency. And here we can see A.M. Klein at the Jewish Public Library in 1945. And moving on in our population, another major player in the history of the Jewish community of Montreal was the Canadian Jewish Congress founded in 1990, 1919, sorry, and a major representative body of the Canadian Jewish community for 90 years. Much of its work was focused on lobbying government around issues of immigration, human rights, and anti-Semitism. One of the terms of the 1990, 1919 Treaty of Versailles were the so-called minorities treaties that committed Eastern European states with substantial Jewish populations, such as Poland, Romania, and Czechoslovakia, to protect the rights of minorities with the League of Nations to monitor their compliance. The CJC was founded in part to lobby the government of Canada to use its influence at the League of Nations to ensure that the Eastern European states were abiding by the terms of these minorities' treaties. So, we have Lyon Cohen, first president of the CJC, but more importantly, grandfather of Leonard Cohen. Uh, and uh, I believe founder of the Shar Shemayim. Uh, Samuel Williams Jacobs uh, founded the Jewish Times, the first English language Jewish newspaper in Canada. So we're becoming a community. I mean, you know, we had, and it's really interesting, the 
I don't know, almost unconscious uh, development ability of the Jewish community, people came here and they coalesced. They formed community structures. They formed, uh, they formed associations to make life easier for the communal Jewish population. Now, let's take a look at where Jews lived. The history of Jewish residency in Montreal follows an interesting pattern. It can generally be described as a westward, westward migration. <clears throat> at the end of the 19th century, Jewish immigrants who came to the city first settled in the area straddling the southern part of St. Lawrence Boulevard, close to the harbor front. Got off the ship, you look for a place to live. In the early 1900s, Jews moved up the main. Now, asking a question, why would Jews move up the main? All of a sudden, anybody want to, what reason would Jews have for moving up the main? Anyone want to take a guess? They started, oh, Michael. The uh, harbor front got too crowded. Good try. No cigar. Uh, the, um, no, it's really interesting. They electrified the trolleys. So you no longer needed two teams of horses to get up the hill on St. Lawrence Boulevard. I think it was 1892, you took an electric trolley, it was the same fare, it didn't cost any more. It used to have to pay extra to get to the top of the hill uh, north of Sherbrooke Street from downtown. Well, all of a sudden, it was the same price. Um, so let's, let's, get, let's get these so here are these people moving up St. Lawrence Boulevard. Uh, they established a thriving, vibrant community featured in local folklore, immortalized by literary luminaries such as Israel Medrez, Mordecai Richler, Hirsch Wolofsky, and Shalamis Yellen. In 1941, there were almost 40,000 Jews living in the vicinities of St. Lawrence and Park Avenue. By the 1930s, a large Jewish presence emerged in the Outremont area, growing to approximately 10,300 Jews, as reported in the 1941 census. Uh, sorry, I lost my... By the 1951 census, Cote Nez had a Jewish population of 12,900, whereas Snowden was populated with approximately 11,600 Jews. Here they come, NDG. There, there goes the neighborhood. Uh, uh, throughout the 1950s, Jews spread into areas that were traditionally restrictive or unwelcoming toward them, namely Hampstead and the town of Mount Royal. Uh, that's a little, well, yeah, I guess that's Hampstead. Um, Code St. Luke uh, was merely farmland when the Jews were moving out there uh, in the 1950s. Uh, it quickly became a growing community. At the time of the 1961 census, the municipality of Code St. Luke numbered 8,307 Jews and some very unhappy farmers. Uh, <laughs> And within 20 years, grew to over 20,000 individuals. Cote St. Luke still represents the largest Jewish population in the Montreal, Montreal metropolitan area. By the 1961 census, there were also significant Jewish populations in Ville Saint Laurent and Chamonix. In the 1970s, the West Island became one of the fastest growing Jewish communities. Uh, and yes, uh, and continued to grow throughout the 1980s and 90s. Finally, the decade previous to the 2011 National Household Survey saw Jews moving in increasing numbers to the south and west shores of Montreal. But that's not our neighborhood. Uh, as of 2011, in NDG Montreal West, French, believe it or not, is the most common ethnic affiliation. 
9,175 people, followed by British, 7,775, and Italian, 5,765. And finally, here we are, Jews, the fourth largest ethnic group with 5,585 individuals. But as we'll see in the next chart, oh, well, not, actually not in the next chart, but as of 1970, the Jewish population of NDG began decreasing. Uh, people were moving out to other places, and this, this flood of immigrants coming from Europe, Jewish immigrants, had stopped. So, you know, what was here was here. Uh, so this, uh, these maps were given to me by uh, Yosef Robinson, who, who did his thesis on this. And here we can see to the left, we see a Montreal-wide map of Jewish residents, the blue dots in 1921, uh, a larger scale map of Jewish residents in the main corridor and surroundings, 1921. 1931, Montreal-wide map of Jewish residents, blue dots, 1931, the larger scale map of Jewish residents in the main corridor. And you can see we're moving north. We're moving north. Uh, 1941, Montreal-wide map of Jewish residents. Uh, again, we're moving west. We're moving west. And I, I'm sure somebody will ask, why? why? Why did this movement up the main <coughs> And then west, why did it happen? Uh, because partially, yeah, that's not, that's not, because they were looking, one, the Jewish community tended to group together because you wanted to be near synagogues so that you could walk to Bravo. They had the money. They, you know, some of those apartments on the main may be renovated now. But, you know, toilets were very attractive things to have in your house. And, yeah, and newer, I mean, you know, the, the Portuguese were moving in. Uh, they, they were more uh, impoverished at the time. The Jews had made their money, and they were moving into the big new developments that were happening in NDG. So what we've got is this incredible pressure of, um, of Jews that were moving into our neighborhood. And if you look at this chart, you can see an interesting thing. Uh, beginning in 1971, the Jewish population of NDG Montreal West began to decline. I think, I don't know if I can, oh yes I can, I can blow this up. So if we look at uh, 1971, we're 7,495, 1980, 6,000, 1991, low 6,000s, 2001, we've crossed into 5,000. We're losing Jews. We're not losing population in this area, but we're, we're losing Jewish population. But let's go back to those glory days of the 50s when things were booming. Anybody want to take a guess at what this is a picture of? I don't know. Actually, that's a good point, Norm. I've never, I, I've never thought that far. This is Benny Farm. This is Benny Farm. Uh, when Western NTG began to develop into a residential community, and think back to those pictures, 1948, it was farms. Uh, Chester Avenue was, uh, was a favorite place for horseback riding. The land where the Cote St. Luke Shopping Center now stands was a stable. Uh, it was in 1946 and 47 that Jews and others began moving to this northwest section of the city. Now, much of the information of the history, this is where we really get into the work that was done in archiving. So what follows are things that we discovered in the archives of Shari Zedek. Uh, and it has allowed the story of the synagogue to emerge. 
By 1951, the Jewish population of the area was, set, was such that on June 18, 1951, a meeting was held attended by 16 Jewish residents where the need for immediate, and I really want to say immediate, planning for a synagogue and for the new community was voiced. As Rebetzin Bright stated in her introduction to last year's Torah reading of Vayichel and, because it was combined, I'm terrible on these pronunciations, Pikude, somebody's going to kill me. Uh, the idea of community is the structural DNA of Judaism. The first symbol of this is to build a place that we can share common ideology where there is a formula and structure to follow, where everyone counts as an important contributor and all hands are needed. And if we're really talking, so look at some of these um, headlines. Jewish congregation gives fine gift to NDG Church because they were having services in the church. Rabbi Cohen says need for Jewish synagogue and center here great. West End Synagogue picks site. Early move on site is expected. NDG Jewish Center headed by I Berlin, Irving Berlin. Uh, spirit of goodwill stressed. It's people, people really pulled together. The, the Jews that were moving into this community needed a synagogue. Uh, let's move on. The meeting led to the purchase of several lots to be formed into a large property on Chester Avenue where the Shari Zedek's buildings now stand. And that was in the fall of 1952. Note in the deed at right. So do I have, no. Note at the deed of right. This actually I find fascinating. Uh, that the vendor is Georges Marcille, one of the original developers of the town of Notre Dame de Grasse. And all of these deeds are in our, uh, in our uh, uh, archives. But what's more, oh, better go back. I got out of control here. This is really fun. And for the people that are in the sisterhood, check it out. Uh, stay home, stay home. Uh, help us realize our dream. Our canvassers will call you on this Sunday, November 30th, 1952. Give with your heart to our foundation uh, cavalcade of the Sisterhood Jewish Congregation Western NDG. The women were going around collecting money door to door. And this is a certificate of location showing the various lots that were assembled. All of these lots were subdivisions of the original lot 151, owned by F.X. Leduc, and that's from the map, the 1879 map. So we sort of see this, this tradition of large farm ownership by French Canadians being subdivided and purchased by ethnics. Uh, so, next. On July 4th, 1951, a general meeting was convened in the social hall of the Knox Crescent and Kensington Presbyterian Church. This meeting endorsed the synagogue project and elected as provisional officers the following people. Irving Berlin, uh, president. Actually, the name Irving Berlin, who is a famous composer, and it was not the same Irving Berlin, although he was Jewish. But I, I've heard the story, we heard from somebody that uh, Mrs. Berlin um, used to call, or somebody, uh, I guess Irving Berlin, called to make a reservation. And so then the woman asked for the name, and he said, Irving Berlin, and the woman said, yeah, and I'm Marilyn Monroe, and she slammed the... <laughs> But uh, Mar Mark Nepperent, Vice President, Louis Eisenberg, Second Vice President, Joseph Elkin, Treasurer, Joseph Berlin, Irving Berlin's brother, Secretary, Aaron C. Goldenblatt, Financial Secretary. And there were lots of people whose children are still in the synagogue today. Uh, in September 1951, 
the congregation conducted its first high holiday services in the social hall of the Knox, Crescent, and Kensington Presbyterian Church, which still exists. Uh, there were 228 people in attendance. First year, synagogue, informal group, 220 people are motivated enough to attend, and congregation membership stood at 183 families. 1951 to 1953, High holiday services and general meetings were conducted in the social hall of the Knox, Crescent, and Kensington Presbyterian Church. August 1951, Congregation Sisterhood is founded. February 1952, always behind the women, the Congregation Men's Club was founded. This is a picture of the members of the Men's Club at the beginning of the excavation for the first building, which is now the daycare next to the current synagogue. September 1951, the congregation began a Hebrew school with seven pupils meeting in parents' homes on a rotation basis. One year later, 1952, the enrollment was 57 pupils, and they met in a rented finished basement. By 1953, the enrollment increased to 100 pupils, and for that year, the school met in the classrooms of the Rosedale School. 1954, there was a student body of 160 students and six teachers, which met in the first Shari Sedek building. Can you imagine the rate of growth of this population? I mean, it's daunting. March 13th, 1952, the congregation was incorporated as the Jewish Congregation of Western NDG, by act of the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Quebec. June 21st, 1953, the sod turning ceremonies of the first building were held at the corner of Chester and King Edward Avenues. And what is amazing, I love this car pass thing. Um, so you got a pass, there was no building. I mean, if you're having a ceremony, the ceremony was on the dirt, there was no synagogue. So you got a car pass so you could park near the, uh, near the site to be built. And this is, this is another thing I found. Uh, these things, I mean, let's face it, folks. Uh, mimeograph is not the world's greatest reproductive process. When you're going through this stuff, the history is there, but it's, it's, it's pretty rough going to understand. But what fun. Uh, regular Shabbos and holiday services were begun in a finished basement provided by an executive member of the congregation. All members of the congregation are invited to attend and partake in the services. Uh, these premises have been made available to us through the kind generosity of Mr. and Mrs. Irving Singerman. Uh, may we have the pleasure of greeting you at the Kiddush uh, in the near future. And I can tell you that I am sure there were new members showing up every single Shabbos. The minute that there was a regular Shabbos service, people were coming in. Uh, it was just a way to, to settle into your new community who had bought a house. Uh, where were you gonna like, identify as community? In the synagogue. And we didn't even have a building. Finally, we're getting a building. October 1953, construction begins on the site of the first building at the corner of Chester and King Edward Avenues. 1954, April, the first religious services were held in the still incomplete building. They just, they were desperate to get the services started. Uh, September 4th, 1954, the first regular Shabbos services, Sabbath services, uh, were conducted in the first building. September 14th, 1954, Rabbi A. Bernard LaFell was formally installed as spiritual leader of the congregation. He retired in 1991, having served for 37 years. Rabbi Charles Bender of the Adath Israel Congregation delivered the installation address, and a number of other rabbis in the city participated in the ceremony. September 28, 1954, High Holiday Services, or here we say High Holy Day, uh, services were conducted for the first time on the premises of the synagogue. But wait, oh, okay, well, the, keep on going. The, the week of December 19, 
19 through 26, which includes the 25th, for those of those, for those to point it out, was dedication week. The activities of the week began with a Hanukkah dedication celebration for the children of the congregation. On December 22nd, the children of the Hebrew school participated in a dedication service, which was followed by an elaborate celebration in the auditorium on December 23rd. Saturday, December 25th, was observed as dedication Sabbath. Rabbi LaFell delivered a dedication sermon and Cantor Fogel rendered the service in a particularly festive manner. And what was really moving, I, I didn't put this in my notes, but it really sort of shocked me, was uh, we found uh, something written, I think it might have been written in Hebrew, uh, saying, like authenticating the education of Cantor Fogel. It was from a, a, a school in Hungary or something like that, saying that he didn't have a diploma because they had to flee the school before they could issue the diploma, but they were certifying that he was a Cantor. It was, it was very moving. And the building was formally dedicated in impressive ceremonies on December 26, 1954. The event was attended by local dignitaries, representatives of the federal, provincial, and municipal governments, Dr. Max Rautenberg of New York, representing the Jewish Theological Sem Seminary of America, who delivered the dedication address. The event was followed, of course, by refreshments and a formal dedication banquet. December 1954, the congregation was granted a new act of incorporation as the Shari Zedek Congregation by the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Quebec. January 17, 1955, the congregation received its charter of affiliation from the United Synagogue of America, the International Association of Conservative Jewish Congregations. September 1955, the Cooperative Agreement for the United Talmud Torahs of Montreal to conduct the elementary educational programs on the congregation's premises took effect. And what you're seeing here is the site map for the newly purchased cemetery land in the Eternal Gardens Memorial Park in Beaconsfield. So by 1955, the synagogue had acquired a cemetery. Within a few years, and this is the irony of the thing, nobody predicted the, the volume, the power of the population that was growing here. Uh, they were in the building for six years, and it became too small. Uh, by 1959, the expansion project that led to the construction of the current building was begun. February 8, 1961, the contract for the construction of the current building was signed with McGill Construction Limited. February 17, 1961, excavation begins for the new building. And I, I find the steel frame, it is rather amazing to realize, I think when you're in the sanctuary of the synagogue, you feel that it's so solid. And if you look, at, this, um, at this, this steel skeleton, it's nothing. I mean, it looks like straws. It, 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 and that is, frankly, the miracle of, of steel. And if you look, again, what's interesting is you can see, oh, I, I sorry, uh, let me see if I can finally do this. No, I was gonna say, you can just see the, the second floor uh, where we have the chapel, is inserted into this giant space that's created, which became the sanctuary upstairs, the huge sanctuary. It's actually a nice design. Frankly, I don't like the outside so much, but it's, it's, it's a really nice design. Um, May 29th, 1960, the ceremonial turning of the sod for the new building at the corner of Chester and Rosedale Avenues was performed by Mr. Clarence Gross, president of the Sherry Zion Congregation, and Mr. Leon Levin, president of Congregation Char Shemayim, representing the older conservative congregations in Montreal. September 1961, first high holiday services were conducted in the new building. 
March 14, 1962, open house of the new building and signing of the contract to manufacture and install the pews in the sanctuary and the chapel. April 1st, 1962. April 1st, wow. First regular daily chapel services were conducted. April 7th, first regular Shabbos services were conducted in the main synagogue. And again, let's just blow this up uh, a, a bit. So this is, and I'm sure we can all recognize this, this is now the scene that we all come to expect as part of Shari Zedek. Uh, and the people, of course, uh, celebrating. June 12, 1962, ceremonies marking the laying of the cornerstone by Mr. Irving Singerman, president of the congregation since 1957, were held. And during this period of constant growth and development, the congregation was served by the following presidents. Irving Berlin, 1951 to 54, Joseph Berlin, his brother, 54 to 57, and Irving Singerman, 57 to 63. And if you look here, so we get a number of, here's Rabbi LaFell, uh, I believe Mr. Singerman is on here, uh, Joseph Berlin, uh, people are looking very 50s. I also found uh, a, a familiar name here. We seem to have a Merson. So we have probably an older Merson, not the younger Merson, who's the president of the synagogue. Uh, and, you know, as we can see, uh, women were members of the board of directors. Uh, so, perhaps the greatest conflict, you know, all was not rosy. Uh, the greatest conflict in the early history of the synagogue was the decision to transform the congregation from an orthodox synagogue to a conservative synagogue. And again, if you're listening for Khan, uh, the orthodox are the very traditional with separate seating, and then the conservative, uh, oddly enough, the conservative, are the more progressive group where there is mixed seating. Uh, we can see it in the minutes of the Executive Com Committee of the Canadian Jewish Congress. Remember, we, we talked about it, that it felt that the matter would terminate in court proceedings. So let's just take a look at that. Uh, Mr. Haynes reported that in the matter of the Shari Zedek Synagogue, in which the board of directors wished to transform the synagogue from an orthodox one to a conservative synagogue, there was nothing further to be done on the part of the Congress, since one party, the board of directors, did not wish to submit the matter for arbitration uh, and for, final and for a final and binding decision. The matter will now probably terminate in court proceedings. Um, and I read this and I thought, wow, I was really surprised. I got this at the archives and I thought, I guess after 50 years, they were letting down the confidentiality of the thing. And I felt I'm really learning about sort of maybe things I shouldn't be learning about. But then, uh, and, and well, when I originally read the minutes of the Canadian Jewish Congress here, I, got, I, I, I was again, I, I felt like maybe this was something that I shouldn't have seen. And then when we were in the archives, we found a number of these for your information and things were, were going out on a regular basis to members of the, con of the congregation. It wasn't like this was a big secret. This discussion was being broadcast to all of the membership. And the other thing we found, I can't remember where they are now in the archives, but we found there was a vote taken to decide whether or not we should have mixed seating. And there in our archives, we still have the, the bulletin de vote, I forget what they're called, the ballots. We still have the ballots uh, from that vote. I guess people were so nervous about switching to mixed seating that they kept the ballots. And they're, they're in our archives. Um, so uh, 
this is it. This is where I went. I, I figured I didn't want to go any further, uh, see whose toes I was going to, and it's probably been a very long time. Uh, so I'm sort of um, sorry for running over time-wise. Uh, we've, unco we've uncovered a fascinating history of our synagogue and seen our synagogue inserted into the history of Montreal. You know, we are, we are so much a part of this place. And, uh, and I think we should all be pleased to be aware of the roots that we have in this community. I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Um, are there any questions? Please don't ask hard questions. Uh, Oh, sure. Thanks, Norm. Uh, we're, if you have questions, I have a microphone that I'm going to walk around with. That's so that the people on Zoom and Facebook can hear what you are saying, and it makes sense when Norm answers you. So are there any questions from the audience? And I will run over with the microphone. Yes. And Norm, you stand here okay. and answer, and I will use the microphone. Or I'll give it to you and you talk right into it. Yeah, this is more a, more a comment than a question. When you were talking about the way the land was divided uh, in the old French... Uh, into coat. No, it, it, the it, narrow it, land strip. Yeah. In Pointe Calière, there's just a, a show, uh, an exhibition that is finishing today. And the story about why they were so narrow was that in the 1600 they're using the seigneurial system, yeah. system, whereby the the government didn't want to have any big town along the shore because it would be more uh, dangerous in terms of uh, uh, an invader. Uh -huh. So they were they were doing very narrow strip of land. If you were a friend of the government or the party or whatever, you would get the first one, and then the people. Uh, so the most arable land would be in the front, and then the back would be more like, you know, like the mountain or whatever. If you are not less fortunate, you get the second and third and fourth rank. It is funny because I was always wondering where my father comes from. The land the, is so narrow that you could walk to your neighbor within five minutes. Where my mother come from and where I was born, it's more like the canton they call that. It's from the loyalists. So if you want to see your neighbor on the same side of the street, you have to take your car. So, so there was like, that explains why they have such a narrow strip of land. Um, that's according to uh, the expert I saw. The, the, uh, and the other thing is funny is like you were mentioned 1950. You know, now you're talking about uh, building home for people, uh, homeless or whatever, because there's a, there's a shortage of, uh, of people to, and in 1950, when you look at what's for sale, and when you when you look at the real estate uh, houses for sale in NDG, it's, it's amazing. 1951, 52, 53. There's just a huge. It's almost like you took all the construction worker in the province of Quebec and they brought it here. It's just amazing to see the number of houses that were built in those days. And, and the economy. I mean, what what is really uh, impressive is. The cost of construction, partially that has to do with labor, partially that has to do with the cost of materials, and partially that has to do with inflation. Um, I can remember when I was a child, uh, my dad took me to the equivalent of what we would say is Westmount. There were also mountains and all of that stuff. And he showed me a huge house, a huge house. And he said, Norm, that building costs Fifty thousand dollars, and I was really impressed. Fifty thousand dollars, and then uh, in my own career, when I wait, when I began developing apartments, and I was selling a one-bedroom or an efficiency for fifty thousand dollars, I remembered what my father had said. And fifty thousand dollars now gets you a parking space. <laughs> Yes, Lily. No, just, wait, 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 Lily. <laughs> just hang on to that. I just find it interesting that the, Sephard, the movement of Sephardic Jews into Quebec in the 60s, when they were thrown out of the, the different uh, 
um, Arabic countries didn't affect the west western part of uh, like there was no mention of them anywhere. No, and there I, was such I, a huge influx in the '60s. I stopped, but again, you know, you have to look at the the concept of Kahila that the Sephardim were coming in as part of our community. We were here. You know, there, I mean, there were Jews who moved to, you know, east uh, uh, on uh, Jean Talon. You know, there was that whole community in Jean Talon. But for the most part, even if you're Sephardi, and I, I don't mean to say even if, but, you know, you're Sephardi, you've come in, you're looking for the Jewish community. So they're not Sephardi, they're Ashkenazi, but they're Jewish. And so you move where they've already moved. We made that move in the 50s. And, you know, as we know historically, it took the Jewish community quite a while to service, to adjust to servicing the Sephardi community. Hi, Norm. There was, uh, what was the impetus uh, for the reason to go from an Orthodox synagogue to a conservative? It was such a huge uh, uh, community. What was the change? What was the impetus? I, as I believe, you know, the vote was not to go from Orthodox to conservative. And I'm sorry if we're losing some of the con people here. But the vote was for mixed seating or separate seating. And... As we know, in conservative synagogues, one of the big attractions is mixed seating. Men want to sit with women. Women want to sit with men. And if we stayed orthodox, we would have separate seating. So that was the vote. The vote was for seating. The vote was not to become orthodox or conservative, but the logical product of that was that we became conservative. Thanks. Okay. I'll, Norm, I'll read you some questions from Zoom. Um, Simon Jacobs in Quebec City wants to know who the architect was of that building, uh, of this building back in the 50s. I should know, but I don't. Okay. <laughs> uh, oh, it was on the slide. Okay. Uh, it was. Oh, okay. We're hearing uh, the name Bernstein. Who's one of the really great old time Jewish architects. What, which architect was it? Bernstein. Bernstein. Um, there's another one here uh, from um, Margaret Black, and she's wondering apart from mixed seating, what other changes would the synagogue have experienced in switching from Orthodox to conservative? Wow, don't make me the representative of the Come Jewish on, community. Uh, okay, so, so we have a number of people. Uh, Gail, take, speak into the microphone. I noticed that uh, when I joined the synagogue in 71, too, apart from mixed sitting, there was no difference because women were not allowed to have a liyah, women were not allowed to do prayers. Girls over 12 were not allowed to join services. So it was exactly the same as Orthodox until... Until two years recently. Ago. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, and I, again, remember when we're, we're speaking about this that a lot of the people online are not Jewish and don't understand the thing because, um, and we're still, there's, there wasn't a huge amount of difference other than, as I said to Arnie, Mixed seating, that was the big, that's what people wanted. And I, yes. Because I know families speak, that, moved, the, that moved from the, sh, like from the Shar Shemayim to the Sher Tzedek because they wanted to be, uh, have mixed seating. They wanted to sit together as families in the sanctuary. They yeah, wanted and, family and, seating. And I, I can remember myself when my, my son was young and we were in a, uh, an Orthodox synagogue which shall remain nameless. And uh, <laughs> we, were, uh, we, we were sitting, I had a, a two-year-old who was running around the, the sanctuary and my wife was there, but she couldn't, he was running up on, on uh, the altar and uh, she couldn't pick him up. She couldn't go out of the women's section. And finally she came over and sort of in a low voice said to me, Take care of your child. Take care of your child. And 
<laughs> and, you know, it, it, mixed seating was a, a, a real, I mean, it's not traditional, but, you know, again, it reflects our integration into the wider society of Quebec. I mean, you know, when, when, women, when women knew their place, uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't need mixed seating. Any other questions? Yes. So, so how much was the, uh, the building built for? How much did it cost to construct the building? I don't know. Okay. I really don't know. And I'm sure we could find the, that in the archives. You know, that's the thing, that's the, the wonderful thing about these archives, that it's, it's now accessible. It's really now accessible. And I, I should, uh, again, talk about, there's my own book, which is a bit of NDG history, the sort of novelized NDG history. Uh, it's on sale in the back for $12.50. Uh, you can get it on Amazon for $7.50, an e-book. Uh, and I just want to thank a lot of the people that were here. These are the reports from the archivists do, who did settle all of the archives and put things together to ensure that the records don't age unduly. And many, many thanks. Just to go, Janice Rosen was uh, part of the Alex Dworkin archives, uh, and they were our co-partners uh, on the grant. She was great. Sarah Wood Gagnon was uh, a, a, um, an, a, what we call a stagiaire uh, for the archives. Melissa Castrone also worked for the archives. Our own Carol Burke was a great help. Uh, part of the sisterhood. Jeffrey Kastner, I, who I don't see enough of, but is a wonderful, amazing researcher through the records. Uh, Talene Akterosian of the Cote St. Luke Library uh, also did a bit of research on this thing. Billy Booth. Billy Booth was wonderful, enabling things. Rabbi Bright, I had a bit of uh, quotes from him, and he really does know the history. Rita Bauer, of course, my wife, my graphic designer, my greatest critic, uh, Michael Wasser, very helpful, true friend. Uh, Mark Merson, the president of the synagogue, who, um, who enabled things. Mark is an enabler. He just, you know, he went, once I got the idea for this, he made it happen. He was really, really good. And of course, Joseph Robinson, whose maps really helped me uh, in putting this thing together. So many thanks to you all. Uh, well, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Norm. Uh, our time is coming to a close. Thank you for you uh, on Zoom and Facebook who joined us today. Um, and Norm, I would like to thank you for a most informative talk and presentation. It's been really quite wonderful to hear right from the Ice Age up to the founding of the Sharon Zedek Congregation and your place in Quebec and, and Montreal. It's uh, so important to know and it's been so educational for those of us that don't know this neighborhood and not part of your congregation. So thank you. Um, thank you to our friends at the Sharon Zedek uh, Congregation for opening your doors and welcoming us in here. Uh, it's been a lovely day. Thank you to Billy Booth and Wendy Tesler in particular uh, for your support and guidance um, and you've been wonderful hosts and for joining us today thank you very much this may be your first introduction to the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network so uh, it, we're delighted to have been invited into this place and to uh, have a lovely conversation with Norm um, if you're interested, we have a few more in our series. The next one is called Welcome to the Whitley Museum. Uh, I looked online, we are 32 hours away from the Whitley Museum by car. And uh, Louise Abbott, Eileen Schofield, and Garland Nadeau are going to be telling us what goes on in St. Paul's River and Bon Esperance on March 21st at 7 o'clock in the evening on Zoom. We're not going there.
<laughs> you can find the speaker lineup to come on our Facebook page and at qahn.org. And if you'd like to watch this again, uh, something Norm said that you would like to, to dig into a little more, uh, you can find the recorded program on our uh, social media pages. Thank you to Glenn Patterson, who runs the, the mothership over there. <laughs> And until next time, everyone, thank you very much for joining us. And there's still some snacks, so uh, grab some on your way out and have a conversation with Norm, too. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>